if you want to turn your Bibles right now to Mark chapter 1. As you're going there, I want to give you a little background on a different story, which you do not need to turn to, but it's found in 2 Kings chapter 1. And it's about a man, he was a king, named Ahaziah. In Ahaziah, I don't know if he was painting his house or if he was maybe changing a light bulb or he was doing something in his house, but it says that he had fallen and he had injured himself. And the injury must have been pretty significant. And so he tells his servants to go off and find a foreign god to consult and ask that foreign god if this injury would lead to his death ultimately or what was going to happen to him. So he sends his servants off to go find the answer to this question. And meanwhile, the Holy Spirit tells a man named Elijah, Ahaziah has fallen and he just sent his servants out to consult a foreign god because Ahaziah did not believe that God was speaking anymore. That's why he sent them to go visit a foreign god to get the answer. So Elijah actually intercepts these messengers that are going to get the answer, and he tells them, the Lord just told me that this injury that the king has sustained will, in fact, lead to his death. So the messengers don't even go to the foreign land. They turn right back around. They go back to King Ahaziah, who's laying in bed. He's injured. And Ahaziah says, why are you back so quickly? And he says, they say, a man stopped us. A man of God stopped us and told us that your injury will end in death. And he said, well, who was this man? What did he look like? And they said he was a man that was wearing a garment of hair and was wearing a belt around. And immediately Ahaziah knew that it was Elijah, the prophet of God. During a time when the people thought that God was no longer speaking, Elijah was the one that made it clear because he was used by God that God is in fact still speaking. Even though you think he's not speaking anymore, I am testifying to you right now by way of prophecy that God is alive and active and is still speaking today. Amen. Amen. If you fast forward a few hundred years later, we come upon a man in the wilderness He's wearing camel's clothes, he's wearing a belt, and he's eating locusts and honey. And he's preaching that the Messiah is coming. And he's saying the Messiah is going to come to end the oppression that we have been under for a long, long time. But similar to the time of King Ahaziah, when this man is speaking and saying the Messiah is coming, there's also a prevalent belief that God is no longer speaking to Israel. And this is the time that he, he rises up and tells them that the Messiah is coming. If people in fact believe that God was no longer speaking, it would take a prophet to convince them that God was in fact still speaking. And that's why we have the arrival of John the Baptist. And he confirms this very thing that God is still speaking, and it's backed up by Old Testament prophecy, which Mark cites right there. It's Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, 1. It says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. John is speaking on behalf of God and in accordance with the prophecy of the Old Testament that the Messiah is coming, that God is on the move, that God is active, even though you may think he is no longer active. As the masses pour in from all over Judea in Jerusalem, as the scripture says, to heed the call of John, the message he preached was compelling and it was exciting. He said, the wait is over. The wait is over. The promised Messiah of the Lord is here to bring vengeance on our enemies and to usher in a new era of freedom that the Lord has promised to us. John's voice is highly regarded concerning the Messiah, which is why so many people went out to hear his message and to receive the baptism that he was preaching. 
Right at the beginning there in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it says, This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark calls the ministry of John the Baptist the beginning of the good news. And John had a very clear message about Jesus. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. That's the first thing that we're going to look at today. When they ask the question, who is this? Which is probably the question that people were asking that were going down to receive the baptism. And they see this man there named Jesus who gets baptized. And when he comes out of the water, the voice of heaven proclaims, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. They're probably thinking, who is this? Because we've heard the voice from heaven in a time where we didn't think God was speaking anymore. Who is this? this. Meanwhile, John the Baptist is saying, guys, this is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the one that we have been waiting for. John the Baptist seems to get this clearer than anybody else in Mark's gospel, and maybe even a little too clear, and I'll go into that in a second. What does it mean to be the Messiah? Well, this all goes back, just to give you some background, it all goes back to 2 Samuel verse, or chapter 7. It's in this chapter that, that God speaks to King David through a prophet. And in that, he makes a covenant with David and he makes a promise, which is called the Messianic promise. And it was in that, hundreds of years beforehand, that people still had their hope that God would one day raise up a Messiah that was like David, but even greater. So 2 Samuel 7, these are some of the things that it says that this Messiah will do. It says that because of this Messiah, the wicked will not oppress them any longer. It says that this Messiah will build a house for the name of Yahweh. It says that this Messiah, his throne will be established and never fade away. So they heard this promise that there was one coming after David that was in his lineage that would set them free from oppression, that would establish Israel among the nations once again, not as a nation that was always belittled and attacked and oppressed over and over again. And at the time they were being, at the time of John the Baptist, they were being oppressed by the Romans. So they're expecting this David-like Messiah that would come and rule over Israel once again and set them free. But here's the thing. When I say John got it a little too clear, he thought that this Messiah was going to come and be just like David. David was a mighty warrior. That's what he was known for. Saul slays his thousands, but David slays his tens of thousands. That's what he was known for. And the fact that they were out in the wilderness, they probably thought, oh, we're out here because we're hiding from the Romans. We don't want the Romans to know that our king is finally here. So we're going to establish this revolt. We're going to go back into Jerusalem, and we're going to take back what is ours. That's what they thought what was, that's what they thought was going to happen. And because they had this view of the Messiah, specifically for John the Baptist, it became a stumbling block for him later on in his ministry because he gets arrested because of preaching this, this Messiah that was coming. He gets arrested by Herod, and when uh, he tells Jesus about it, Jesus doesn't set him free. And he's thinking, I, I thought you were this warrior Messiah that was coming in. Why aren't you setting me free from prison? And Jesus, in fact, says, do not be offended on account of me. As in John, don't be offended that I don't look the way you thought I was going to look. And John ends up actually dying in prison. Jesus does not set him free the way that he thought he would be set free, based on his view of this Messiah. But even though John the Baptist got it wrong regarding how he would do it, what he did get right was the who. The who was that this is the Messiah. And this is the true beginning of the good news of the gospel, is that Jesus is the Messiah. I think why I know this word is lost on us today because of the cultural gap that we face. If I went around and told somebody the Messiah is here, they would be like, is that a new restaurant in town? Or like, is that a food truck that came? What are you talking, the Messiah, what is that? 
It doesn't have very much cultural uh, implications or applications for us today. It doesn't make much sense. But I think the principle is still the same. See, the Messiah for them was the one that they knew they could finally count on. It was somebody I can put my faith in. I can put my trust in. It's somebody that I know will lead me to freedom when I am facing things like oppression or things that I cannot get free from myself. This is somebody I can put my hope in. And he's coming. He's coming right now. He's arriving right now. See, Jesus is the one you can trust in to do what is just and right. You can follow him in confidence, knowing he will not lead you astray. He's your protection and your comfort and your peace, and he's there in your times of need. That's what the Messiah was then, and that's who the Messiah is now. The who is greater than the how. The who is greater than the how. Jesus is the Messiah, and that is all that counts. That's the beginning of the good news. You have to get that part right, that Jesus is the Messiah. They were looking for someone to destroy the works of Rome. That was their how. But they didn't realize that Jesus was coming to destroy the works of darkness. Let me tell you something about Jesus that I love. Jesus will set you free from things you didn't even know were oppressing you. He came to set them free from something they didn't even know was the real problem. Yeah, Rome was a problem, but it wasn't the problem. Jesus said, I'm coming to to set you free from something you don't even know is oppressing you. Jesus is the answer to questions you didn't even know you had. When we come to Jesus, if we just get the who right, that he's the Messiah, if we just submit ourselves to that truth, he will begin to do things in your life that he knows you need, but you may not even realize that you need. Mark 1, 4 through 5 says this, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now this this baptism of John still to this day leaves a lot of people confused as to what exactly it was. John's baptism was a a one-time baptism. It was a come and do it once and that's the end of it. To receive what I am preaching. Many people believe that he was modeling it after what's called a proselyte conversion baptism. And essentially what this was, was any time somebody that was a non-Jew wanted to follow Yahweh, the God of Israel, they would have to go through a baptism, a full immersion, in order to enter into the people of God. But that was only reserved for non-Jews, so Gentiles, that wanted to come into the people of God. That's the only time it was ever used. So was it possible that John was treating the people of Israel like Gentiles, calling them to repentance as if they had never served God in the first place? Was John saying to them, you have fallen so far away from the God of Israel, it's as if you're a Gentile that never knew him in the first place? It's very possible this is what John was preaching. And it makes the most sense to me because you need to think about this for a second. Even Jesus himself received the baptism of John. John tried to deter him from receiving the baptism, but John said, no, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. That's in a, in a, a different gospel, not in Mark. Because remember, Mark's like, get to the point, get to the point. So is this what he was doing? John was calling Israel to repent of sin, not just the individuals within it. You need to think about this for a second. He wasn't just calling individuals to repent. He was calling all of Israel to come and repent because they collectively had walked away from God. So John's baptism shines a light on something interesting, which is that Jesus himself practiced repentance. Jesus himself practiced repentance. 
See, John's demand of baptism would have been so offensive to any Jew who knew that they were not an unclean Gentile. That's what they, that's what they refer to him as, unclean Gentiles. How dare you tell me to get baptized? I'm a child of Abraham. I came up in the lineage of Abraham. I don't need to do this baptism. Yet they were all doing it. When one is saved, they are joining the people of God. You know that when you get saved, you join a communal people of God? You join a communal identity as God's people. And God's people have a collective mission together. And this shines a light on something that was happening here, which is that repentance reorients us to God's mission. Repentance reorients us to God's mission. I don't know if anybody else does this, but I'm a list maker. I like to make lists. A good day starts with a good list for me because it's all about productivity. So I'll get all the things that I need to do down on the notepad and I'll start working. But it's inevitable. At some point, I end up on YouTube or I end up on Instagram or I just I get sidetracked and do something that is not on the list. But I always come back to the list. That's what I do is I just turn and look at the list. And the list is the way to get me refocused back on what my mission was for that day. It gets me reoriented for what I was setting out to do at the beginning that I knew I got sidetracked from doing. The list leads me to repentance because it turns me back to what I was supposed to be doing the whole time. And this is what John is telling them to do. He's saying collectively, we have failed as the people of God. We have failed to accomplish the mission of God. So we collectively need to come together and we need to repent. We need to refocus ourselves on what we are here to do as the people of Yahweh. And repentance also makes up for where other people have failed. Jesus was faithful in the areas that Israel was unfaithful. Many theologians would tell you that Jesus was Israel. He was representing Israel through all of his actions, which is why he himself was baptized as well, because he was, he was representing Israel. But he was faithful where the Israelites were unfaithful. Where they failed in the wilderness with Moses, Jesus was faithful. Where they failed in temptation to Satan, Jesus was faithful. He remained faithful, and he was a representative of the Israelites. But this is the situation we find ourselves in. Jesus is getting baptized. He's getting baptized for sins he never committed. Jesus was sinless, but yet he was responding to a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because he was identifying with his people, Israel. Did you know that there's areas that you may not have failed in, you may not have sinned in, but your faithfulness in those areas can actually heal the wounds that were caused by those who did fail in that area. I want you to think about this. As a representative of the kingdom of God, your voice speaks for the rest of us. Your voice speaks for all the other Christians, all the other people that call Jesus Lord. People know what the news says about Christians. But when people know you, your voice carries weight. Your voice carries weight on their perspective on who Christians are and what we believe. People have read the stories about pastors falling into sin. That's what they think Christians are like or pastors are like. But your voice speaks for the rest of us. Your model and example speaks for the rest of us. I can't tell you how many times I found myself in a position where I'm talking to somebody and they tell me I've been hurt by the church. I've been hurt by people in leadership. I've been hurt by this or that. And I don't know what church they're from. I don't know anything about the situation. I don't know the pastor they were under, nothing. But what I do in that situation is I'll say, look, I wasn't there when that happened. I seriously, I obviously was not part of causing that pain. But as a pastor and as a Christian, 
I want to say sorry on behalf of the rest of us because that should have never happened to you. What happened to you is not right. It wasn't of God. So I use my voice as a representative in the kingdom of God to step in and say, I'm sorry, even though I myself did not commit that wrong to you. But I'm going to apologize on behalf of the rest of us. You see, it's okay for us to admit as the big C church that we've not done everything perfectly. It's okay to say we've made some mistakes. Even if you weren't directly guilty of something, it doesn't mean that we can't say on behalf of everybody, hey, we made some mistakes. If I'm being honest with you, I think within the church we can do better with loving some, of our, some people that right now are being pushed away by the church. We can do better with race relations inside the church. We can do better with engaging the the gay community inside the church, if I'm being honest with us. I don't think we've always done the, the best job as a big C church on approaching those things. And so my point in all this is, is even if you're guiltless in one area, you have the opportunity, just like Jesus, to say, I didn't do this, but I'm gonna step into it as a representative of this people, and I'm gonna do something about it. I'm gonna do something about it. Jesus himself was practicing repentance. Repentance doesn't always have to be because you committed the sin. It's just a matter of changing of direction. John wasn't running a small operation out there in the wilderness. The scale that he was operating on and the weight of his words got some people thinking, that he was possibly the Messiah. And so John had to defend his case many times that he was not, in fact, the Messiah. And one of those times is how we get what was written in verse 7. It says in Mark 1, 7, and 8, it says, This was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The last thing that we need to know about Jesus today is that Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John's defense for why he was not the Messiah was because of what the Messiah would do later on. It wasn't just what he was going to do in the immediate. It's what he would do later on. He will baptize in the Holy Spirit. John was expectant of somebody coming after him whose ministry was so powerful in comparison to his that was so royal in nature that John himself, he said he was unworthy to to tie his sandals for him. Now, just to give you the background on that, the Talmud, which is a book that was created by rabbis, which was pretty much, it answered all these different questions on, uh, just lingering questions on what does it mean to be a, a good, faithful Jew that follows God, and they would have all these commentaries on what that looked like. It's extra biblical. It's not, it's not canonical. Extra biblical material. But in it, there's one thing that says that uh, rabbis that had disciples The disciples should do everything for the rabbi that a slave would do except remove his sandals. So he should do everything for the rabbi that a slave would do for his master except remove his sandals. And John is saying, I, even in comparison to a slave, am not worthy to untie the sandals of of this man coming after me because of the glory and the royalty of who he is. And it wasn't just the glory of Jesus, it was also the work that Jesus would accomplish, which is baptizing in the Holy Spirit. So John not only prepares them for his arrival, he also prepares them for the outpouring of the Spirit. Note that John is also saying you need to be ready for what's coming. It's the baptism and the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit secures the freedom that Jesus gives to us. Israel, over and over and over again, they would get set free from their oppressors, and they'd go right back into it later on. 
They'd get free and end up in bondage once again. And that was the cycle of Israel over and over again. But John's saying there's one coming. There's a Messiah coming that's going to set you free. But then he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And what is that going to do? That's going to empower you to stay free. You're finally going to be able to stay free. You don't have to go back into oppression anymore. You don't have to go back into vices and bondage anymore because he's going to give you something that will empower you to finally stay free from the things that have plagued you. Romans 8, 3 through 4, look at what Paul says. He says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son and the likeness of sinful, sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Even Paul is acknowledging there was something that came before Jesus that was powerless in the sense that it couldn't keep people free. It couldn't keep them free, but by the Spirit, but by the Spirit, we can stay free from the things that have plagued us before. This is what John is saying is coming after. And the last thing is this. I mentioned that they had this idea of Jesus that he was going to build this army and they were going to go back in and take over Jerusalem and take over their land once again. And they didn't realize that Jesus was really going to set them free from oppression. They didn't even realize they were under. But here's the thing about the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit, among many things, is an empowering for the work of God. So for Jesus to say, I'm going to baptize in the Holy Spirit, Jesus was really saying, I'm going to raise up an army. I'm going to raise up an army of people that are empowered by my spirit to fight the battle in the heavenly realms that is going on right now against principalities and forces that are at work that you cannot see. That is the army that I am building. And the first step to that, the armor that you're going to put on, the sword that you're going to have, the helmet that you're going to wear, it all comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is what I am giving to you for the fight that we are entering into. The baptism of the Spirit is the empowerment of God's army. And we need that today. We need that in Glen Ellen. We need that in the workplace. We need that in our own lives. Do you know that's what's going to keep you free? When Jesus sets you free from whatever it is you're facing, it's the spirit within you that's going to say, all right, this is where we stand. This is where we stand. We don't go back. We stand and move forward. Amen.